Well, that was a great introduction. Could you do a little more of that? I was enjoying it, actually. <laughs> um, a kidding thing, when they talk about Governor Walker, we had him down in Texas recently doing a fundraiser for him but with Governor Perry. And a group of us were kidding. There was a lot of people from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. We were kidding that, you know, that's probably the two best governors in America standing there side by side. So that was a pretty good effort for all of us. And uh, for a moment, I was just seeing Joe Bast, El Presidente. Oh, there he is in the corner. You know, so President, you don't have to sit in the corner. You can, you know, you can have a little better seat if you want. <laughs> and I thank all of you for being here. Oh, well, old friends, new friends, and folks I'm looking forward to getting to know. Thank you for joining us. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of, of written, uh, and not really paying that much attention to it, but they've limited me to half hour. And if I don't have some kind of limit, you can forget that half hour stuff. Uh, no, <laughs> excuse me. I get started telling some of these stories. We'll be here for the rest of the month. But I just want to say one cute thing that reminds you of what this book's about. Anybody from Lake County ever heard of Willard Helander, the clerk of Lake County? Yes. She is a wonderful lady, does a fantastic job as clerk, and, uh, and has caught some election corruption several times, and actually uh, a few illegals who were voting are now back in Mexico because of her. She was so successful at it, Mike Madigan and the Chicago Democrats introduced a bill and passed it through the House and the Senate to strip her the ability to run elections in Lake County. I mean, you wonder what corruption's like. I mean, give me a break. I mean, anyone who's ever worked with her will tell you she's probably the best county clerk in the country. Oh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, just to begin, it's an overview. Some people say my book, Chicago Confidential, is a, a partisan attack, but no, not really. You know, I'm, you'll see President Obama, his name's in the book, but he's not a central figure. I don't really attack him. I, I mean, he's, he's there, he sort of has to be, which is Chicago. Um, but this was Barack Obama's training ground. And to be quite frank, uh, some of his friends and some of his policies fit quite well into a story about corruption. But I, do, I don't really attack him. I don't, you know, we sort of leave him in peace. Well, I, not that I didn't want to say something bad about him. It's just that I was on good behavior. But this story isn't just a uh, political book. It is. Uh, but I've tried to write a story, as I'll explain later, that's sort of fun, uh, got good humor, little romance, ton of action. Uh, this could easily be true. Actually, almost all of it is true, to be honest with you. Um, I do not have a good enough imagination to make this stuff up. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. You really can't. I mean, all I did was change the names to protect the guilty. And people say, well, you don't really need to do that because, you know, in libel, the truth is your own defense. That would probably be true any place but the Cook County court system. <laughs> and I, uh, I figured if I libeled Mike Madigan, I'd, oh, well, you know. Anybody here, the lawyer, I might need counsel. We'll talk later. Uh, but really, you know, why did I write the book? And, and, and it's a perspective. Let me, these are the kind of things that are rarely covered, and that's why I think it's important to mention it. Kind of a perspective where the book comes from. Uh, I'm an old University of Michigan jock, so I, even though I'm from Illinois, I went to Michigan. And there's a town in Michigan called Detroit. Well, it's not much of a town anymore, but when I was going to school there in the 60s, it was an impressive town. 1.9 million people, booming auto industry, the whole works. Now they've lost 1.2 million people. And, and Detroit is a disgrace. I mean, everyone talks about what a disaster Detroit is. Losing 1.2 million. Chicago's lost a million. And you never hear a word. Think about it. In the history of the civilized world, only Detroit has ever lost more population than Chicago. Somebody ought to ask questions why this is happening? Well, this book is sort of the answer to why some of this is happening. And that's part of the reason you write the story. The Obama press corps really is not particularly good at covering some of these things, and they're sure not going to criticize Chicago right now. Uh, and so you sort of have to have ways to kind of get around his people and really talk about what is happening. And at times, I, I intersperse Illinois and Chicago. I lived here. I know they're not the same thing. Although based upon who's governing the state of Illinois, they are. I mean, every elected official that, that counts in the state is a Chicago Democrat. So uh, when I use them interchangeably, I'm sorry, but that just, that's facts. That's life. Now, I plead guilty to use a certain, using a certain amount of sarcasm, cynicism, and mockery. That's probably the best way to deal with a political organization. Uh, almost more effective than saying, by the way, he's a crook in a sleaze bag. Sometimes you're better off doing it with humor. And then when you're dealing with an organization that is this corrupt and this totally out of touch with reality, sometimes cynicism and sarcasm is all you can come up with. 
I mean, when you look at some of these guys, and I believe me, I've known a lot of the guys and some ladies fairly well. And I still have no idea how anyone takes most of them seriously. But for some reason, they do. And this is the kind of thing that it's important to think about. Do you realize there are dozens of Chicago Democrats who are taking home anywhere from a million to several million dollars a year? Think about that. You know, if they were just stealing a hundred grand a piece, who cares? Geez, in Chicago and Illinois, what's a hundred grand? I don't really mean it, but you know what I'm saying. But you're talking about guys who are taking home millions. You know, that old line, if you steal a little bit, oh, what the heck. But when you're stealing this kind of money, at some point, someone should ask questions. I'm not sure who's going to, but someone should. And part of this, because Chicago has probably the nation's most docile electorate. I have never seen an elector who will vote in and elect more idiots in my entire life. <laughs> I mean, you go back to 2006. Was there anyone in America who was even moderately literate who didn't know that Blago was at least ethically challenged, if not a total crook? And he had, whether you like or dislike Judy Topinka, she was a 12-year statewide incumbent. She was at least a creditable candidate. And he murdered her. And he was a crook. Okay? I mean, you just want to say to the electorate, think about this a little bit. Jesse Jackson, when Jesse disappeared for those months, are you telling me that nobody had figured out that the feds had finally caught up to Jesse? <laughs> Wins in a landslide. Okay. Todd Strozier in 2006. What did they call him, Urkel? I mean, did, I knew Todd Strozier a little. He's actually a nice person. He actually is a nice guy. I want to stress that. But I mean, you think about that, running the second largest county in America, Illinois, on its own, it's like the 18th largest state in the country. It's like Wisconsin, uh, Maryland. Would you have elected Urkel, the governor of Wisconsin? <laughs> Got elected. Um, in this last election, weren't there two Democrat state reps under indictment during the election and they both won? <laughs> Pat Quinn? Do I have to say anything else? Pat Quinn? <laughs> and, 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 and I have a favorite sort of line about Chicago party hacks. My wife has helped a few people in campaigns, and her guy, she's dearly in love with a fellow named Dan Duffy, who's the Republican senator from Barrington, who is a wonderful guy, a wonderful senator, a good conservative guy, okay? Because she ran his campaign, he invited us down for the swearing in. I wasn't really thrilled to go. You know, I've been through a couple of those things in my day in the hundred years I spent in Springfield. But my wife wanted to go, so I went. And John Cullerton was moving up to be the Senate leader. And so to be nominated and seconded and all that stuff, he asked a guy named uh, Lou Viverito from, I think, Stickney to second his nomination. And here's Lou Viverito with his glasses on, with a written thing, struggling to read full sentences. The assistant majority leader in the Senate was struggling to read something written on a piece of paper. Uh, you know, and he got elected in a landslide. Anyway, that's why I say sometimes you got to ask these questions. And Chicago voters, they really don't seem to care about underfunded pension funds. Now, for any of us who've been in the securities area, like my old pal Alan Crane and I were together at, at Oppenheimer, they say Chicago's short, 90, I mean, Illinois short $90 billion. <coughs> well, if you get an investment return that no, that no pension fund or no investment manager in the entire country is getting, and you get it every year for the next 30 years, their number's right. But if you use an actuary who's actually com uh, competent and not on the Chicago payroll, they're not short 90-some billion, they're short 200-some billion. And Chicago voters don't care. They re-elect the same guys. Pension fund scandal. Remember Tony Revsko? He was my neighbor. <laughs> well, one block over. I don't want to get too intimate about it. But. And remember when they said he had, his, he had made $30,000 a month payments for an, his mortgage and his property taxes? I used to either ride my bike by or walk by his house once in a while. When they said thirty grand. he is getting it cheap if he's getting that house for thirty grand a month. I mean... And yet, all those guys were reelected despite all that stuff going on. <clears throat> bonded indebtedness. Just in the last couple of years under Blago, the state has more than tripled its bonded indebtedness. Illinois has the highest per capita bonded indebtedness in the country, as well as the highest per capita debts of everything else. Illinois has not had a balanced budget since the last century, before most of you were born. That was the last time they had a balanced budget. That is unconstitutional and illegal. That has no effect in Springfield. No one even cares. They have not had a balanced budget since the 20th century. And you wonder why they're the mess they're in. 
We're ranked 50th out of 50 states for fiscal policy. And the voters reelect them. And Illinois is bankrupt. Uh, it actually is bankrupt. I'll say a little more. But, and this has all really happened in the last 15 years. When Jim Edgar left office, and you can like or dislike Jim, we were seatmates when we were freshmen. And actually, I, all right, I'm already in trouble. I'm going to do my first aside. Um, Jim and I were seatmates, pretty good buddies, and, and, and played tennis together. And I want to tell you, he was a heck of a tennis player. He whooped me every time. And I was not as good as Fred, but I was a pretty good tennis player. But anyway, we sat right in front of George Ryan. And George had one of these bills that we thought people would get indicted for passing anyway. And it was for his brother, who was American Kikikee. And Jim and I wouldn't vote for it. It allowed them essentially to hold special municipal elections on 48 hours notice and you could hold them on weekends. <laughs> I mean, I just, Jim and I were going, you know, hey, George, we want to help, but come on, man. You know? Anyway, he got upset, and I, I'm going to clean up the language. George had a very, I would say, a very broad vocabulary if, if he was mad. And he referred to Jim and me as a whole series of things and concluded by calling us cupcakes. So then he stomps away because we don't vote for it. Now, Edgar, his image was true. He was a teetotaler. He didn't swear. He was married to his college sweetheart. But he was exactly what his image was. He was a very nice fellow. And anyway, but after George Rand stomps away, he looks at me and he goes, you know, Roger, I think being, I think being called an effing cupcake by George Ryan just might be a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't. Anyway, sorry, I got an aside. Now, when Jim Edgar left office, we had a billion dollar surplus. The pension funds were in decent shape for a big state. We were doing fine. Illinois was still a competitive state in terms of national, uh, do you want to do business here, live here, taxes, whatever. But now think about this, the changes. How many of you are aware that Illinois has been charged with by the Securities and Exchange Commission for securities fraud? Oh, thank God, at least a few people know. <laughs> in the history of the United States, there's only one other state that's ever been charged with securities fraud. Uh, New Jersey under John Corzine, as if that's your surprise. Um, but, pardon? Oh yeah, he, he, please don't. <laughs> he went to the University of Illinois and used to work for Continental Bank. Thank you for reminding us. It's, I mean, Illinois, even when we export them, they're crooks. <laughs> but you think about it. I mean, when Blago was governor, you think he was corrupt? I mean, he even committed securities fraud. And yet no one went to jail, no official charges. And in the case of New Jersey, they did the same thing. And I had to laugh with John Corzine. He's an impressive crook. I don't know how this man has avoided jail. Now, now those of you who know me know I spent probably 15 years at, at Morgan Stanley and Oppenheimer and some fine securities firms and was a branch manager and stuff like that over time. If I had done what John Corzine had done at, at uh, MF Global, I would have been in jail right down the hall from Bernie Madoff. Madoff, however you pronounce it. And Corzine. They, don't, they haven't even find him. I mean, the man is such an open and obvious crook. Anyone in the securities industry knows it. And he's, he's still raising funds for, uh, who's that guy, Barack, what's his name? And getting away with it. Now, all of us know if you've got government, there's corruption. A bigger government, you've got bigger corruption. We all know that. That's nothing new. And sadly, that's normal. But this level of corruption, this is not normal. You know, if you get outside Illinois and you see these other places, I mean, they all laugh at Illinois. I never realized I tried to help a Republican candidate with some fundraising in Texas because I met a bunch of the oil guys. God, are there a lot of rich oil guys in Texas. <laughs> but nobody's an oil man. They go out and buy 1,000 acres of land in the hill country, put about 20 longhorn cattle on it because you get a tax dodge if you got longhorn cattle on it, and they call themselves ranchers. I don't know what it is. No Texans an oil man. They're all ranchers. <laughs> I, but anyway, I tried to raise money, and, and I remember one guy saying, you know, if Illinois went to hell, would anyone notice? And I said, oops. I didn't happen to agree with him, but that's not the point. I mean, this is a guy who gives a lot of money to candidates all over the whole country. Wouldn't even contribute to a guy in Illinois. Didn't think it was worth the effort. That's our image. This is not good. But when we talk about corruption, how many people remember Dick Simpson from when he was an alderman? Okay. He is a legitimate progressive Democrat. I would say a little in this side of Karl Marx. But he's a good guy. I mean, he's one of those guys you can disagree with him and still say he's a good and honest guy. He's just wrong. That's all. But he's a good guy. He had the professor at the University of Illinois. By the way, someone told me Simpson's actually a Texan. I don't know if that's really true. Uh, but somebody told me that. Is it? Okay. Anyway, but he did a study comparing the most corrupt cities in the country. Guess who came out number one? Guess who came out number two? Guess who came out number three? We were the top three. We, we won every category. It's the most corrupt city in the country. And this is the guy who's a Democrat saying it. So 
Yes, we have that study, but let's compare. Four of our last seven governors have gone to prison. That's more than the other 49 states added together. We ain't just number one. We got number one by a long way. We're impressive. Chicago has 50 aldermen. Just in the last few years, 37 have gone to prison in what Sandy Jackson's about to go. 38 out of 50. You can hold city council meetings in prison. You know? I mean, and it's father, son. Remember, uh, uh, God, those guys from the west side, last name began with a C. Do you remember their name? Not Compton, but close to that. First, the dad goes to jail. Carruthers, Carruthers, he goes to jail. Then his son gets elected alderman, then his son goes to jail. <laughs> hey, voters, remember I said they're a little docile? I served with Johnny DiArco. Remember his dad went to jail? So Johnny. I mean, when I say I've served with some tough guys, I've served with murderers. I mean, Johnny, he went to jail for fixing a murder charge. Anyway, on a tangent, excuse me, 38 aldermen. According to the Chicago Tribune, over 1,000 municipal and state employees. And I will take my one partisan shot. The Tribune reporter estimated 975 of them were Democrats. But still, over 1,000 state municipal employees jailed. We sent an attorney general to jail. <laughs> Bill Scott, I'm sorry to say. Two state treasurers. How many Crook County officials have we sent to jail? I can think of four or five just in the last few years. Then Graylord. We have sent more judges to jail in Cook County than the other 49 states added together. We aren't just corrupt, man. We are big time. And then the building department. You remember in 19, I mean 2010 when they sent 15 inspectors from the Chicago Building Department to jail? Well, there are 18 inspectors. I knew one of the prosecutors, a lady. She was a good friend of mine. So I called her up and I said, what kind of incompetent twit are you? You get 15 and you can't even get the other three? And with her sense of humor, she says, well, listen, incompetent twit. I had three informants. I couldn't send them to jail. <laughs> 18 out of 18 city inspectors. I could go on, but you get the point. I mean, it, it, it is. But that's why I say, when you get outside Illinois, this, this level of corruption is not normal. There's corruption everywhere. There's corruption. I mean, look, I live in the Hill Country. That was Lyndon Johnson's old congressional district. I guarantee you there's corruption <laughs> in the Hill Country. But, but still, it's, it's not like this. It just is not. This is not normal. Go elsewhere, you'll see this. That's part of why this is a corruption fight that needs to be fought. And that's really what this book is about, taking on more of the Chicago corruption. You know, I fought the battles here, and I have the bruises to prove it. Now, we're in mixed company, so I won't flash some of the bruises here. But... I can prove I fought those battles for years. I have been called everything but honest by the Chicago Democrats. Of course, I viewed that as a compliment. But still, it's the fact that when you fight these guys, they're tough. And somehow you can never get scrutiny for what's going on in Chicago, outside Chicago. And this is sort of a way I was trying to get a little more scrutiny, kind of get outside, I don't know, get outside the Obama press corps so at least somebody would cover this stuff. I mean, a guy like Dick Simpson writes a great report, but you know it doesn't get covered very often in, in newspapers. So I tried to put a little, make it a little more human, put some flesh on the bones, give somebody a little excuse to pay attention to what's going on in Chicago. This is one of the great business cities of the world. And I still want to say is, I don't want to say was just yet. But, I mean, but I'll, I'll tell you one little secret. Um, anyone ever heard of a company called Caterpillar? Okay, you know, they're, they're kind of important. Once you get south of I-80, you got Caterpillar and uh, the University of Illinois and uh, the state government. That's about the only employer south of, of I-80. Caterpillar just moved another uh, billion some dollars worth of research facility to Texas and they already have a, a manufacturing plant outside Waco that employs over a thousand people. Um, are you catching any hints here? Do you know what would happen to Peoria if Caterpillar picked up and left? When I was elected, Caterpillar, 1976, Caterpillar had 66,000 Illinois employees. They're now hidden under 20,000. You know what that's doing in central Illinois? And let me tell you another one that I don't think is public yet, although if you've heard it, then maybe it is. State Farm, the only other big employer in southern Illinois, they just took over a building in Tempe, Arizona, where they're going to put a minimum of 1,000 employees. I mean, it uh, doesn't take a rocket science to figure this one out. What would happen to Central Illinois if Caterpillar and State Farm left? I mean, we might as well just roll up the sidewalks. We cannot afford this. Sort of That's why the point of this book, somebody's got to say this stuff. And I'm not afraid to say who the guys are. And on the book, to avoid being sued for libel, I admit I, I cheat on a few of the names. But, I mean, we are talking, we're talking Mike Madigan. We are talking John Cullerton. Madigan makes several million dollars a year. When I say the press will never cover, cover stuff, Two years ago, the New York, New York Times, not some right-wing rag, the New York Times, did a series of articles about corruption of the corporate property tax system. 
Michael Madigan, by their numbers, has to have been taking home several million dollars a year and has been doing it for years. Several million! All for influence peddling. And he's not in prison. John Kellerton makes big money. Another one of the crooks is Lisa Madigan. Not because she's a crook, but because she doesn't do anything. If someone's standing in front of you with a gun aimed at someone and you don't do anything, you're an accomplice. She's an accomplice. Ed Burke, my old buddy Ed Burke. God, anybody knows Ed Burke knows he's just a wonderful guy. But you read that New York Times article, he's taken home a couple million dollars a year also. Anita Alvarez and Dick Devine. Excuse me? Uh, Anita Alvarez, for 13 years, it was in charge of the uh, public corruption section of, of the prosecutor's office before she was elected. Do you know how many public corruption investigations she did in 13 years? <laughs> Talk about look the other way. Um, you just think of Joe Berrios. I mean, do I have to tell anybody about Joe Berrios? If you don't know about him, okay. Tom Tully. Tom Tully's a name you wouldn't remember. He was a, he was a Cook County assessor in about the late, somewhere in the middle of the last century. He's another guy making close to a million dollars a year. Tom Hines, the old assessor, he's making over a million, according to the New York Times articles. And then an old friend, Neil Hardigan. Anyone remember Neil Hardigan? Yeah, yeah I wish you did. Jeez. Talk about a lousy attorney general and lieutenant governor. Um, he sat on the board of Freddie Mac with some kid, Rumbo, or what was his name, uh, Rumbo, uh, yeah, anyway. While Freddie Mac was going to hell in a handbasket, the two of them were on the board, and Neil Hardigan was on the, um, the accounting, what's it called, you know, the board subcommittee that reviews the way they do their accounting? Yeah. They're making $350,000 a year to sit on a board while the company's going to you know where in a, in a handbasket, mm -hmm. and nothing happens to either one of them. This is kind of why I wrote Chicago Confidential. I mean, when you look at this sort of stuff, and you know it, and you get, nobody's writing it, at some point you got to write it. And of course, I, I, I talked about it a long time, and finally my wife's the one who convinced me to do it. She blackmailed me. She said, if I didn't finally write the damn book, she's going to throw me out of the house. And you know, in Texas, it's hot in the summer. I really didn't want to stay outside. So, okay. so that's my background, the reason I did it. Next, the story. What is the story? It's, and really, I think it was cute. A guy who wrote a real positive review described the book as Forrest Gump meets the crooked Chicago political machine. <laughs> but it's a true novel, which means it, 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 is, it isn't really fiction. As I said, all I did was change the names to protect the scumbags. And the city's, what it is, the two, city's two biggest street gangs, kind of really fierce rival, one black, one, one Mexican. They get caught because of a fight with a Mexican drug cartel and the way the black guys are distributing the drugs and the black uh, the cartels using fast and furious guns, which is probably true, and um, and that's what the fight's about. A lot of people get killed, pretty violent, but frankly, compared to what goes on in the streets of Chicago, it's kind of wimpy. And uh, this is Chicago right now. This is what's happening. I mean, I didn't make this stuff up. I don't have a good enough imagination to make it up. I sort of followed what was going on, and in the gang, although I, I I don't call them the gangster disciples, they're the gangster disciples, and, and that sort of stuff. And these are the two biggest street gangs, and there, there's a feud going because of the Mexican drug cartel. And I think most of you know Chicago is the major distribution point for Mexican drugs. It comes up to Chicago, and from Chicago it's distributed out. We have the honor of being the headquarters of the uh, Mexican drug cartels. I think maybe they're going to take over the building the Caterpillar used to be in, something like that. <laughs> I don't remember. But that real world scenario is a story. But instead of a not very bright Forrest Gump, I substitute a very bright Chicago detective, a Chicago police detective with a very unique background and a checkered path. You know, in a book, the guy can't, the hero can't be always in a white knight. I mean, you gotta have something about him, so he has a rather checkered past. <clears throat> and then he and his law enforcement allies, <coughs> they're trying to take on the, the, the gangs and, and the violence. And as they're doing their job, trying to fight the crime, just trying to protect common citizens, they are undermined by the corruption in Chicago city government. And I, so just like Forrest Gump and the story where Forrest Gump may be fictional, but remember, all the episodes are real stories? Well, it's the same thing. The police officer is, is, is fictional, but each of these little episodes are real corruption stories, stuff that really happened. Um, so the story's told around the fact that Chicago is America's most corrupt big city, murder capital of America. You remember last summer, 19 people got shot in one evening? You know, even in a big town like Houston, they don't get 19 shot in a month. We had 19 in a day. Chicago really is number one, baby. We're tough. Um, we're also the city with the most jailed political figures. We've got a pretty good lead on that one, too. 
vote fraud capital of America. But I do want to tell you a little inside story that Madison, Milwaukee corridor up there, they might be passing us up for vote fraud. Those guys are really good at vote fraud. Um, we sent our last two governors to jail. So this is a real life story of Chicago outside the spectacular downtown and our impressive lakefront. Chicago political organization in the book and in reality is filled with hangers on, nepotism, blatant corruption, vote fraud, corrupt justice, bribes, fixes, hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil prosecutors. Now I'm going to tell a story. I think you all know who Anita Alvarez is. She's our Cook County or Crook County prosecutor, state's attorney. One of the reasons I had to leave for Texas when she was running for election, I made the mistake in front of an audience saying, you know, you got to ask Anita whether she's for or against corruption, because based on her record, it's not obvious which side she's on. <laughs> she really took that very personally. I, don't <laughs> I think the other one that irritated her is when I said, you know, the war on crime, Anita's on crime side. Yeah. That's why I'm in Texas. You know, Anita, she really has no sense of humor at all. I don't know what her problem is. But again, in Chicago, truth is stranger than fiction. I don't have to make this stuff up. It's right there. So Chicago police detective Ross Sonny Sun Warrior. He's a Comanche orphaned at a young age. You've got to give the guy a little something to play with. Um, he was a Special Forces Afghanistan veteran. Uh, the guy got a unique checkered uh, career, past uh, et cetera. And, um, and he had a couple partners named Vlad Kozak. And, and the Vlad Kozak, for those who have read this far already, Vlad's a real person, but I really toned it down. The real Vlad Kozak, I can't put in a book and, and not sell it when it's, would it, if it weren't rated R. But, it, but it's an interesting character. He was a retired Chicago police officer. The stories about him are pretty true. A guy named Harold Brookins. I picked Brookins because, in my opinion, one of the finest of the Chicago Democrat senators for years was a guy named Harold Brookins. His son's the alderman from the 21st Award. And I just, for the fun of it, I named it after. I checked with Harold before I named it. And he said, Roger, as much as the machine hates me, this won't do, do me any more harm than I've already done. <laughs> so that's, that's where I borrowed that name. Um, and so they're sort of the, they're, they're battling the, the gang war, and it's being subsidized be, and being pushed a lot more violence by the Mexican drug cartels. Remember, they gain by all this stuff. You know, they, as we get back to it, you know, they're great believers in uh, violence doesn't bother them. I mean, just take a look at what happens in Mexico. And so they're pushing the violence between the two gangs so that they can strengthen their position in terms of stronger turf. That's happening right now. I mean, did anybody read newspapers recently? I didn't make this stuff up. That's what's going on today. And even though, I, it's funny, I, to my chagrin, I'm staying with my brother and he reads the New York Times, which is why he doesn't really know much. But they have a whole story about Chicago tactics put super dent in killing trend. Good job, guys. <laughs> it takes the New York Times to pretend that the Chicago doesn't have a corruption problem. Anyway, but so as the battle continues, uh, Sunny Sunward, become, they become ever more immersed in the real political corruption. It becomes ever more obvious that the gangs are tied in the Chicago political establishment, who are none too pleased to have Detective Sunny, Detective Sun Warrior mucking around in the hidden soft underbelly of their political power. You know, this gang connection to the Chicago Democrats, I didn't make that up. In fact, there have been a series of articles, that even one uh, a guy named Isaac and then something else just wrote one recently, you know, naming names as to who the connections are. I mean, has it, have you ever thought about all these street gangs are shooting and killing people on their own turf, and you notice no one ever catches them? You ever notice nothing ever happens? You ever wonder why? Now, there are two reasons. One, uh, some of you may know, I, after I got off active duty in the Army, I stayed in the reserves, and I commanded you where we had a bunch of Chicago police officers. And this one guy in particular used to remind me, he says, you, know, you think there are all these unsolved crimes. They're not unsolved. We know who did it. But if a gangbanger kills a gangbanger, well, if I bump into the guy in the street, I'll arrest him. But I'm not going to waste time chasing him. He's just improving the quality of life in Chicago anyway. And so that's part of the problem. The police aren't going to go after him. Why bother? And these guys work precincts. Don't kid yourself. The gangster disciples are the strongest component of most of the South Side ward organizations. Don't kid yourself. That's real. That's not made up. So in the Hispanic gangs, man, they go from precinct to precinct. Okay, you're Jose Menendez at this precinct. You're Raul whatever at the next precinct, and you're whatever at the next precinct. They can go around buses doing that stuff. That's why, what's the Cook County clerk's name? I've forgotten it now. Oh, oh, David Orr. Talk about the most underrepresented schmuck in the whole thing. You notice he almost never clears the voting rolls? Do you know why he doesn't clear the voting rolls? It isn't because he's trying to protect your right to vote. It's that if he cleaned the voting rolls with all the vote fraud, you'd see the turnout's 96%, and you know there was something wrong. But by leaving Tina and me on our house's address in Wilmette for the next 10 years, 
the turnout doesn't look like 96 percent. It looks like 62 percent. A little high, but nothing unusual, so nobody asks questions. Just what you forgot is how many guys voted who are dead or don't live there. But by keeping so many names there, it covers up the corruption. So anyway, sorry, I got on a tangent on that. Okay, now I uh, like a little line I, I wrote, I gotta read this because I wrote it carefully. The investigation approaches a deadly end at the intersection where Chicago street gangs, Chicago political establishment, political correctness, uh, political corruption, and the operation fast and furious weapons converge. And Sonny Sunderland, you're, I mean, he's in the spot, they're after him now. What time is it? I didn't wear my watch. You got it, you're good. Okay, pardon. And so what happens is, <laughs> Sonny gets in trouble because he then starts to cooperate with a uh, savvy drug lord, one of the heads of the gangs. The guy's smart enough to figure out, you know, I should get along with the police, and Sonny's smart enough to say, if I listen to this guy, I'm going to learn something. And so all of a sudden, Sonny's now declared himself the enemy of everybody for sure, because he is now has a working relationship with some of the street gangs. You ever talk to a Chicago police officer? You think that isn't true and common? You know, some of the street gangs are well aware if they pass along a little information, not on my gang, but on your gang, the police leave them alone, you know? So, I mean, again, I didn't make that stuff up. Then the investigation digs a little too deep. It becomes obvious there are issues bigger than a bunch of street gang thugs selling drugs and killing each other. In Chicago, the political leaders are involved in almost everything. Investigation, they go after Sonny at the end. They try to, you know, the drug cartel says, we can't have this guy in the middle of it, and they go after both him and his family. Ever happened in Mexico? See, what are they, up to 50,000 people have been killed in Mexico by the drug gangs now? And you wonder why the Mexican government's a little upset with us? After all, who uses those drugs? It isn't the Mexicans using those drugs. So it takes all of Sonny's skills and his experience as Special Forces guy just to survive that. There's a, for those who've read it, you know there's a pretty action-packed ending. And I would ask for those who have read it, don't tell people what the ending is. You know, because that's sort of meant to be a surprise. And uh, believe me, no one's expecting the ending, uh, ending of the way the story comes out. That's the way I've written the book. I, uh, one of our, uh, our reviewers referred to it, this is not a novel as you think of a novel. He said, this is faction, not fiction. In Chicago, truth is stranger than fiction. And all I did was change the names to protect the guilty. Now, if someone would like to ask some questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. I have one. Thank you. Wait, what, first, yeah. second. I'm about to say, yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. My question, though, is, is one, given the pervasiveness of the corruption, uh, what would be your solution to, to try and minimize it, because you're not going to eliminate it? And then two, uh, there's a joke that goes around that we knew Bin Laden was dead because he was registered to vote in Cook County. <laughs> <laughs> He's registered my old address. You know, I, this sounds bad for me to say the solution. I don't have one. Change the Chicago electorate. I mean, these people elect these guys. These are elected officials. These are not appointed. These are elected. I, I, the solution is just eludes me. Now, there are a lot of social causes I'm not going to get into. There is one at the state level. I think you're all aware the state's bankrupt, okay? The only way the state of Illinois functions is they, they sell, how they got this hit by the SEC, they sell bonds and don't mention the state's kind of deeply in debt. The state uses bond sales that they sell now to finance immediate expenses. That is illegal. It is illegal to use long-term bond expenses to pay present expenses. We've been doing it for years now. And yet, there's only one person who really has a right to do anything about it. That's the Attorney General. And I don't think she's going to indict her father. She ought to. But, so that, but coming back to there's only one way to solve this pension problem. This is why I don't think it's solvable. That's why I'm now in Texas. A lot of people don't know in the Illinois Constitution, there is a provision that says you may not lower a public sector pension. Well, those pensions are, pen are public sector pensions, government employees. You can't lower it. You could probably freeze it, but that that not even go to the Supreme Court. So unless they change that provision, you can do anything you want. It doesn't matter. You're so deeply in debt, you cannot dig out because the hole's so deep. Now, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but without a constitutional amendment, Illinois is bankrupt and has no ability to get out of bankruptcy. And at some point, and as a guy having been in the securities industry, I can tell you, 
you know, some point people start looking at those bonds and go, no way, Jose, I'm not buying them anymore. It doesn't end slowly. It, boom, it'll end and nobody will buy the bonds. And then we've got a big problem. Okay, Fred? I'm going to hold my question. Mary and then Alan? Now, did everyone hear the question? Okay. Yeah. Is I actually I, I'm not sure he's actually doing that. He wants his he actually wants his daughter to be president. He'd like her to be the first female president. But it's so insoluble. I think he's trying to get her to go do something else. Because even if she is governor, there's nothing she can do about the pension problem without a constitutional amendment. Now, have you ever bothered to look at these reports on where the money comes from? What are the two biggest sources of money for the Democrat Party in, in Chicago? Employees. Public sector employees and trial lawyers. Who never gets screwed in Illinois? Excuse me. Who never gets messed with in Illinois? You know, what's Madigan going to do? That's his money. And, and he's doing an old trick. John Coulton passes one bill from the Senate. Mike passes one from the House. They go to conference and never quite agree. Now all of, of Coulton's guys can go home and say, we passed a bill. It's the House's fault. And Madigan's guys can say, we passed a bill. It's the Senate's fault. God, you know how many times I went through that when I was in the Senate? It's unbelievable. And Madigan, these voters in Chicago keep falling, falling for it. They're not just not docile. They're dumb. I mean, it's embarrassing. It is so obvious what they're doing. But again, I don't know how they solve it. I mean, and I, I know a bit about, about it. I don't know how they solve it. I don't think it's possible. I mean, I think, literally, I'm saying to you, I think Illinois is bankrupt. And if Illinois were a private company, it would have been forced into bankruptcy by its creditors long ago. Mm -hmm. Alan? 67% increase not being enough. My governor, my state senator, my state rep are all say the holy grail is a progressive income tax. Uh, one more reason. What do you think? Do you think that's going to happen? Do I think a progressive income tax a will pass? Amendment, yeah, it takes a constitutional amendment. Um, this year, no. But at some point, you know, what choice do they have? You know, follow their leader. Let's see, Barack Obama always wants to tax all the poor people, right? You know, I mean, who, where are you going to get the money? You know, who is that guy, Willie Sutton, who says, why does he rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Yeah. Who do you tax? You want to tax on public aid? You want to tax someone who has a job? You're going to have to tax the rich. You can, we got three empty bedrooms on the second floor, Alan. We can talk about it. But that is one of the real problems. That, 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 that they don't, as I say, they don't have an answer. There is no solution without a constitutional amendment. Well, Jim. there's a solution of a, of a kind. Uh, when they go bankrupt and default on their debt uh, and you know, the credit rating goes to hell and people move out because they see what's coming down the pike is not only a progressive income tax, but a tax on retirement income for which does not exist now in Illinois. And those are the people that have the money and they're going to go to states like Pennsylvania and uh, Florida and Texas, Nevada, a lot of good states. Tennessee. Even with better uh, weather. Yeah. The, the thing is at the state though, I, I partially agree, the state can become insolvent but can't declare bankruptcy. That's why, remember they had that idea with the pension funds to send the pension funds back to the school district and municipalities? It's actually a brilliant idea. Now, I'm not saying I'm for it, but let me explain it. The city of Chicago and the county of Cook, who funds 100% of their pensions? The city of Chicago and the county of Cook. The state pension funds, who funds a major portion? The city of Chicago and the county of Cook. So they're saying, why should we be paying for a pension fund for Effingham when Effingham doesn't help pay for Chicago or Cook County? And if you kick it back to the Effingham school system or the town of Effingham, they can both go bankrupt. Therefore, by pushing the pensions back out to the people who in many cases have run them up, I do want to say a lot of those school districts are pretty doggone guilty for being in a hole. But the point is, if you then take those pension systems and shove them back on Wilmette and Evanston, Wilmette and Evanston can go bankrupt. And then that solves the state's problem. I'm not advocating it, but they were not stupid to come up with that idea. There is some logic to that madness. Now, for those of you who live in the suburbs, well, you know, hey, that's, come on down, Dripping Springs. We've got a lot of empty land. <laughs> okay. Following up with that, uh, I'm in Wilmette, your former home. Oh, school. yes, yes. And so our school districts, we negotiate a contract right now. Teachers are doing it in secret. Everything is very shady about it. But they are worried about the cost shifted. So if they cost shifted back, obviously we need lower teacher compensation, pensions or wage or something, benefits, work more, something. And no one seems to want to face this or even talk about it. And it seems like an easy solution to me is you just 
you pay less on new employees, new employees IRA, 401ks. It starts it on the right track, but no one wants to seem to do this, especially Will Met, and I think Will Met's more liberal than Edwards did. And there's, oh. there seems to be no hope whatsoever. If you think his comments are, are, are disquieting, let me go a step farther. Who are the largest contributors to school board races and supply the largest number of campaign workers in school board races? Teachers. The teachers union. Who do you think's on the board? I mean, yeah, it, the Wilmette, I'm just using Wilmette as an example. Wilmette is a moderately affluent, I like to call it an upper middle class, you know, uh, suburb. Um, when we were there, the teachers were receiving a minimum, well, first of all, everyone remember inflation is about 1%. The teachers were receiving a minimum 4% a year raise, then the step raise in the seniority raise. So most teachers were getting a minimum 6 to 7% a year with 1% inflation. You want to know what the problem with the pension fund is? Because their pension goes up six to seven percent a year. But Wilmette is not paying that extra proportion. And then what they do in towns like Wilmette is the teacher's only got a year or two to go to thank the teacher for not causing any more trouble than necessary. They make them an administrator and give them a hundred some thousand dollar year salary for like the last year. So they pay based a pension on, based on a hundred some thousand for a year, but they collect it based upon the 28 years they were a teacher or whatever. In, in one last, Nutcher High School, Hank Bankser, who was the superintendent for this one, he retired on a three hundred some thousand dollar a year pension. I like Hank. He was a good guy. Where he's a great golf partner. But three hundred some thousand dollars a year. Well, it sounds like Lake Forest High School. You probably are familiar with Lake Forest. <coughs> the teacher struck last year, and the average salary is what was one hundred and thirteen thousand dollars at Lake Forest High School. And then the superintendent. Why didn't I work at Lake Forest? You yeah, know. And the super. Well, they're getting a lot more teachers now. So when they retire, they're going to all be hundred thousand dollar pensions. You know, all of them. But right. Harry Griffith just retired last year, and he's ready sixty one on the list of the two hundred highest uh, people in in all of Illinois who receive <coughs> pensions. Okay. Do everybody hear that using Lake Forest an example yes. where high five the all salaries is? Remember when I said the problem on the pensions is insoluble? Because the next group coming down, they owe more money and they've got less money contributed. So the, it compounds every year. It isn't just bad now, it's worse next year. It's worse the year after that. Uh, I thank you for bringing up the Todd Stroger election. I was Tony Parekh's campaign oh. manager, and I had just managed to get those nightmares out of my head. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, With that ex uh, experience now fresh in my mind again, why do you think it is that the issue of public corruption doesn't seem to resonate with voters in Illinois? because it's hard to attach a, a tangible sense of cost to it, or is it for some other reason? Okay, did everyone hear that question? Damned if I know. I do not understand Chicago voters. I really don't. Well, it's the rest of the state, too. It's, I, I grew up downstate. Yeah, but and uh, given it's in the Metro East, one of the more corrupt areas. Yeah, now that's not a fair comparison. That's almost as bad. Uh, but I've lived there. I lived in central Illinois, and it's almost an indifference to it that, you know, you pick up the paper and you see someone else is going to jail and go, eh, what's for breakfast? Well, let, let, me, let me follow up on that just a little bit. The Chicago voters are the real problem. Keep in mind, when, when uh, Pat Quinn stole the last election, and we can perfectly well prove that Bill Brady won. I don't care if you're for or against Bill Brady, that's your business. We can prove he won. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Pat Quinn lost or carried two counties. Bill Brady carried, what, 101 or 100 counties, whatever it was? What do we have, 103 counties? Yeah, now that I've moved to Texas, you know, these things are fading quickly. But, I mean, the point is, 100 counties on one side, two counties on the other, and guess who won the election? But this is how bad the corruption is. We could prove, particularly in the Latino pre, uh, wards, how many votes had been stolen, but they weren't being stolen to help Pat Quinn, they are being stolen to help uh, Joe Berrios. They had to get Joe Berrios in as assessor because that had a huge effect within the Latino communities. So actually the vote theft was by accident in terms of the effect of Brady. <laughs> it, was, it was vote theft, but it was a different vote theft. Um, but we could prove it. We had, I mean, I had poll watchers out there all over the place. And I mean, and, and the corruption, I mean, it was so open. You'd call the state's attorney, you'd call the police, no one ever shows up. That, and I, that's in the book a little bit about that too. But anyway, so, but Brady's answer when I said, yeah, Turkey, I can prove you won. He says, I hell out, Roger, you, that does nothing. I can prove I won. But then I go to the Chicago Elections Board. Let's see. It's 42 Democrat, isn't it? Then I can appeal to the Cook County Court System. Oh, yeah. Then I can go to Cook County Appellate Court. There's not a single Republican on the Cook County Appellate Court. Then I can go to the U, uh, Illinois Supreme Court. Let's see, what is it, 5 to 2 Chicago or Democrat? He knows he won. 
But he, his joke was, I can spend a million dollars on legal fees to have the Illinois Supreme Court tell me, oh, by the way, we stole the election. What do you do when it is that bad that you are completely aware that they stole the election and the papers don't even write about it? Don't even write about it. I mean, downstate it is a problem because they laugh at Chicago. What they don't realize is they better quit laughing and trying to do something about it. And, also, one of the, and I will say the Republican leadership is not exactly an asset. I'll be on good behavior, but I'll tell one story. Champaign-Urbana, you may have heard of this town. They'd had a Republican senator since the day of Abraham Lincoln to like four, six years ago. And a lady won by 500 votes in, uh, was it 2008? Yeah, the big lands of 2008. The Republican leadership in Springfield cut a deal with the Chicago Democrats. If you don't attack the Republican senator in Danville, we won't attack the Republican senator in, in the Democrat center in Champaign-Urbana. The Danville district, the Republican wins with 65% of the vote. The Champaign-Urbana district, the Democrat won by 500. So they have these non-compete contracts. You will never get any of those guys in Springfield to admit it. But I just want to tell you, these non-competes are real. But the difference is our guys are so stupid, they say, if you don't compete against a guy you couldn't beat anyway, we won't compete against somebody who's sitting in a seat that has never elected a Democrat in the history of the area. Our leadership is a lot dumber than you think it is, and most people think they're pretty dumb. Well, let me start, but if I forget the second, remind me again. The Civic Federation is a great group. Um, Better Government Association, Andy Shaw is a great group. Uh, what's Lauren, Lauren Small's group? Yeah, they're all good guys. But who cares? Now, I'm going to embarrass Andy Shaw since he's not here to defend himself, but Gayla and Fred are here. Andy and I have been friends since we were 13 years old. In fact, one time I was dumb enough to lend him my car in high school and he broke the back window. You know what it was like to try and tell my parents that uh, what happened to the back window? In fact, Andy's grandmother and my grandmother were friends in Hyde Park. I don't mean to embarrass Andy, but we both grew up wrong. But coming, I mean, he does good work. He does good work. Who cares? I mean, does it affect the voters at all? Remember when they came up with Better Government Association did something with Fox, uh, Dane, uh, Dane Plack on those guys? They found that Cook County owns like 20 some thousand cars. Okay, I mean, and they have, they have them stored in these parking lots out in the forest preserves and whatever because they're buying it from some friend to somebody or other. What do you do with 20,000 some cars? And, and, and did anything happen? Let's see. I mean, who's, who's running the county board? I can't answer your question. I don't know why they're not effective. I don't know why the voters don't care. Now, what was your second question? When, uh, when there's no bid for our bonds. Oh, when there's no bid for our bonds, that's going to get interesting because it just comes to a halt, everything stops, and they can't print money, they're going to go to Washington and ask for a bailout, and a lot of the bond buyers buy it because they think it, you're going to be, they're going to be bailed out by Washington. What they keep forgetting is there's something called a Republican House. And if you think John Boehner is going to bail out Illinois knowing that California and Nevada and Connecticut and Rhode Island and all these other states are right behind, it, they're in a prayer. But, but everything just comes to a stop, they can't pay bills. It's never happened. We'll find out. Oh, so, oh, yeah, Don, excuse me. Now, here's a bond expert. Uh, there, Roger, there's only one way, and the gentleman over there hit the nail on the head, that you can stop all this nonsense. And this, yeah, they're coming with another issue, okay? And Wells Fargo is going to be the lead manager. It's going to be a billion sum. Um, I saw the presentation on it by uh, the guy that's head of capital markets in the state of Illinois, Mike Sinsheimer. Mm -hmm. This bond is going to be called, it's going to be probably labeled as a moral obligation on the part of the state of Illinois. They changed bond councils from Chapman and Cutler, who's an excellent firm, to Mayor Brown. If anyone works for Mayor Brown, there's a reason we call him Mayor Brown and Scumbag. Excuse me. If any of you work for him, I apologize in advance. Go ahead, Don. I, I, can't, I can't validate that because I didn't do that much work with them. But the point, the point here is that even my brethren out there, the portfolio managers, are sticking their head in the sand, and it's not because of Washington. It's because their their analysis is faulty, yeah. and they're not asking a proper question. And uh, the only way you're going to stop this nonsense because it, it's a it's a, 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 a 
bunch of money that the politicians can play around with. Yeah, it gives them a billion dollar no slush fund. Yeah. Well, Don, so many of you may not know, but Don was one time one of the largest bond buyers in the country for Allstate. And I want to tell you, that is coming back to what Don's saying in your question. At some point, people are just going to quit buying, and you're on uncharted ground. Never happened in a state before. It's happened in municipalities, but that's different. Then they just declare bankruptcy and the courts come in. Well, your municipalities, but you've got trustees that are just stupid. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, let's not get on that subject, Don. We're in good behavior today. <laughs> but, but that's it. I mean, it's going to happen, and, and where do you go? The, the answer is we don't know. If we're in such a fragile state, what's going to happen to Obamacare? Well, I can tell you what I'd like to have happen. But part of it is, same thing, they've got to fund more, get more of it funded in Washington. And remember um, Kathleen Sebelius, she's been caught trying to get companies to contribute voluntarily to help pay for the implementation. Now that is illegal. I mean, that is absolutely, cabinet members raising funds is illegal. So, but we just, and so, I mean, I, I don't see how they're going to get Obamacare to really be implemented. Just, they don't have the money. I mean, you, everybody's broke. Their government's broke. In fact, let me give you a statistic you guys don't know, so we finish up. Everyone thinks that people buy the federal debt. No, they don't. Over 60% of the entire federal debt is bought by the Federal Reserve. In other words, they just print money. So all they're doing is printing money. Now, how are we doing time-wise? We've got a few more questions. Here. Okay, we've got a couple more, and then Sherry? Yeah, Sherry, all I can say is I live in Texas now. <laughs> I mean, I'm not dumb. I know what's going on. Yeah. And, I, and again, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I apologize if I am. But I don't think there's an answer. Illinois is about to be the, the test case for America. So does it end, if, let's say Mike Madigan takes all of his millions and moves to Hawaii, Texas. does it end with him? I don't know. Yeah, you're asking if Mike Madigan moves away. I don't think he's capable of moving. He loves the power too much. Yeah. But at some point, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think we'll be broke before he leaves. But the advantage for he and John Cullerton and all those big Democrats, they've made millions. They do move to Florida or Hawaii or to, or actually, if they're smart, they'll go to someplace where there's no extradition treaty, probably go to Costa Rica. <laughs> but but I, that's what I was saying. The trouble with Illinois is it's hard to predict some of it because this has never happened. And, and again, with a president from Illinois who's part of this very political organization, he will try to help. But... We're uncharted waters. We really are. I mean, we've never had a state be insolvent. California was kind of insolvent, but they have, they've somewhat, I mean, this will sound crazy. Is this something nice about Jerry Brown? I mean, what, what do we used to call him, Governor Moonbeam? Yes. But you know, by Pat Quinn standards, Jerry Brown's really pretty good. In fact, by Pat Quinn standards, Jerry Brown's Ronald Reagan. Um, <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, Brown, to his credit, in some liberal ways that we might not have agreed with, has done some stuff in California. We've done nothing in Illinois. So you know, now that I've made a downer out of it, we got any more questions? <laughs> um, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm, oh, wait a minute. I'll throw, oh. oh, I'll throw one more. You mentioned about the Fed buying program. Uh, you, how do you see that unwinding? Eventually, the Fed is either going to have to let those bonds mature or they're going to take a loss. Uh, there's implications for the country, but clearly, uh, yeah. inflation-wise, uh, the question is, what's the Federal Reserve going to do with the trillions of dollars of Bonds they bought at face value, they're not worth face value. They have to hold them to maturity or they'll take the loss. They have to hold them to maturity. But for a moment, since most of you are too young to remember this, I was a Reagan operative in all those early campaigns. When Reagan came in, remember, this is what they'd been doing under Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter made the mistake of appointing a man named Volcker, chairman of the Federal Reserve. And Volcker was a monetarist. And he started constricting the money supply. And that's part of the reason Reagan was cutting taxes. Yes, he was in favor of what they're doing, but he's cutting taxes because he's a supply sider. But 
That's all that saved us because when Volcker started constricting the money supply, as he had to do, you notice Reagan never criticized Volcker. It had to be done. But that's what got uh, unemployment up to 10.7, and, and under Jimmy Carter, the inflation of that recession hit 15%. I was president of a bank then. We, we, our, we could do mortgages at 18%, 18. So I'm saying that issue, it's going to be inflation, it's exactly what happened with Carter. There's a lot of money sitting out there, and the definition of inflation is when the money supply expands faster than the supply of goods and services. Our economy is growing like this. The money supply is growing like this. Take one more. Okay, one more. One more question. Is there traction in Washington State and Colorado with the legalization of drugs, and could that be a solution? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, let's, let's move on. I have, no idea. I have no idea. That's what I don't want to get into. Uh, yeah, I, I have no idea what that would do. Actually, thank you, thank you.